Good morning. And welcome to our final outdoor worship for the year. We are glad to be together and glad we currently have shade. Uh, so let's make this snappy. Our, uh, our announcements are on page 14 of your service folder. I invite you to take a moment to check that out. Uh, we do not have name tags today. So every time you see Vicar Nicholas, just shout your name at him first. He'll pick it up very quickly. Uh, a few other things worth noting. Uh, Prayers and Squares is indeed not meeting tomorrow due to the holiday. They'll be meeting on the 8th. A reminder also that next weekend is Rally Weekend. Uh, it begins with the Fiesta at 5 o'clock. We are in need of extra help, assistance. So make sure that uh, if you are able to contribute in any way, uh, that you let Emmy, Ashida, or the office know. Uh, that way we can make accommodations. We need help setting up and cleaning up. So make sure uh, if you're around or able to do that, it would be greatly appreciated. This is also your reminder that next week we resume what we call our regular uh, worship schedule, which means we'll be worshiping at 8 and 10 with education activities for all ages in between services, uh, including a Bible study on the book of James. So that is something to look forward to for next uh, week. So that concludes our announcements here this day. And now uh, let us begin our service with the rite of confession and forgiveness printed on page two of your service folder. When we confess, we acknowledge the ways we've been living apart from relationship with God and each other. Gracious God, we confess our sin, our separation, and our suffering. Grant us mercy undeserved and extravagant. So we are restored to dignity, belonging, and purpose that come from you. We are loved by a God who keeps promises, whose grace is restless to find and free us, who calls us beloved from the first day until the last, always eager to welcome us home. Friends in Christ, your sins are forgiven. May your liberation be a gift to the world still aching for freedom. Amen. And welcomed in the freedom of God's grace and forgiveness, let us share the gift of God's peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Also with you. I'd invite the assembly to take a moment to share a sign of that peace here this morning as our service continues with our gathering song. I'd invite you to rise as you are comfortable in doing so as we sing together.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Together we pray. O God, our strength, without you we are weak and wayward creatures. Protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside and cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves, that we may be preserved through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The assembly may be seated for the readings this day. The first reading is from Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 2, 6 through 9. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you, nor take away anything from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God with which I am charging you. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I am settling, setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely, so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from James 1, 17 through 27. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the world of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But he do, but be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perse- persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Word of God, word of life. This time I'd like to invite the kids up for a special message. Seems like some of us are already up here. What are you guys making over here? This is wild. What is this? We don't even know, do we? All right, that's okay. Here, everyone, come on forward. Come have a seat with me. Let's do this thing. Come on, have a seat. You can get back to that creation when the time comes. Your hands hurt. Yeah, I can't imagine. Can't imagine. (laughs) All right, friends, it is good to see you today. I want to share with you one of my favorite parts of uh, traditional Lutheran worship, which is the workout we get every time we worship. So I want to share with you uh, our our worship workout here today. So one of the first things that we do in our service is we uh, we greet each other in peace. Everyone, let's stand up. Okay, so let's let's do the this is how you do the peace, right? You go like this. You turn this way and you go like this. You turn this way and you go like this. Ready? Let's do it together. Ready? And one, and two, and one, and two. Very good. All right. So the next one is the greeting, okay? So this is is the big one, right? This is usually my part. And when I say the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and I go like this. So ready? One, two, three. Right? Here we go. Let's do it again. Very good. All right. Now we would sit. All right? So let's all sit. Oh, but now there's a gospel. We've got to stand back up. All right, so now we got to stand back up. 
All right, the gospel's over. You got to sit back down. Oh, but now it's the hymn of the day. Back up. Here we go. Very good. Okay, so we see the up and the down is a good part of our tradition. Another part of our worship tradition is when we get ready for communion, right? So there's a lot of things. One of the things I want to show you is a special prayer position. Are you ready? It's an ancient uh, position for prayer called the Oran's position. It goes like this. So ready, relax, and Oran. Relax, and very good. Then we got to get ready to distribute communion. This is how you distribute communion, okay? It's like this. The body of Christ broken for you. Ready? The body of Christ broken for you. Ready? The blood of Christ shed for you. All right, very good. We got it. Okay, good. So now you know all of the movements. The point that I'm trying to make is when we worship, our tradition uses our bodies. We're moving, we're standing, we're greeting our neighbors, we're using our words, we're changing our positions of how our body sits to show God and to show each other our respect, but also that our heart is in it. And today our readings talk a lot about how it is that what is most important when we worship God is what's on our hearts, right? We have all these traditions around us of different things we can do, and we do these things because these are ways for us to kind of get our bodies and our minds and our hearts centered for worship in a way that shows that we're ready to worship. So I'm glad that you were able to do that. I hope you got the blood flowing this morning. You look very limber now, so this is good. So let's do the last thing. Let's end with a prayer. So this one is a simple one. Fold your hands together. Okay, relax your shoulders a little bit. Okay, and you can repeat after me, everybody. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day, this lovely breeze, and this perfect opportunity to worship you. Amen. All right, friends, you may get back to your drawing, your dogging, or whatever it is that you have going on. The rest of you, you may rise for our gospel this day. gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from within the human heart, that evil intentions come fornication, theft, and murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, one of the most challenging classes for me in seminary was worship class. I went into that class with a, a lot of fear and anxiety. 
But the bad news is this. Worship, as it turns out, is a pretty core class if you're going to become a pastor. Uh, it's right up there with preaching, pastoral care, and potions, the big three Ps, of course, right? Um, so at Hogwarts or wherever I went, uh, this really brought me a lot of anxiety. And, and what I realized was I didn't like worship. I did not like going as a kid. When I made the decision to go to seminary, everyone was kind of, kind of shocked by that decision. And so here I am trying to figure out how am I going to make this work. And I think what freaked me out the most was I looked around at my classmates who really, really loved worship. And I felt grossly inadequate for the task ahead. How? How in the course of a single semester am I going to learn some 2,000 years worth of tradition and embody it in such a way that a congregation won't be able to figure out that I don't know what I'm doing? Well, as it turns out, I passed the class, thank you very much, and I learned quite a bit along the way. I learned all the different diagrams, diagrams for how to set up a communion table, uh, diagrams for, for wearing vestments, diagrams for proper processional order for festivals. I learned all those things. I learned how to plan worship. I learned how to do the liturgy. I learned what the word liturgy means, which I didn't know means the work of the people. But the most lasting memory I have was something that was probably a very throwaway sort of lesson from Dr. Ben Stewart. It was in the middle of one class. I think we were going through the various uh, motions that you do when you're presiding at the table. And he said something along the lines of, just always be aware of your body because every motion you make will be perceived as intentional and therefore meaningful. Everything you do, be aware. When you stand, when you fold your hands, when you put your arms out, when you itch your nose, people are going to think there is a deeper meaning and tradition behind it. So always be aware of your body because of the perceived power that comes with those actions. Now, worship is a very powerful act for us. It in many ways stands at the center of our communal identity. It is where we find our rest. It is where we do our work. And our work as Christians, though, we well know is not limited to a single hour once a week, nor is our work limited to those people who we share peace with on Sunday morning. The mission field is much, much larger, and the work is much, much larger as well. And authentic worship itself actually begins when we are sent forth in service to others. But authenticity, you see, is at the center of our worship today, particularly of our gospel. A gospel that begins with the, with the scribes and the Pharisees making an accusation against Jesus that he is breaking with tradition, that he and his disciples are doing it wrong because they're not washing their hands. Now, Jesus being Jesus, of course, hears what they have to say, honors it, and turns the other cheek and walks away, right? Right? No, not at all. He calls them hypocrites. He then quotes scripture at them in what I would call a very passive-aggressive way, saying that they do nothing more than pay lip service to what it is that they are saying. And then he accuses them of abandoning God's commandments. That's a lot. Jesus clearly is taking very seriously these accusations against his own authenticity and his practicing of his faith. And authenticity here is key. That, that hurled insult that Jesus starts with, calling them hypocrites, really stands out. It comes from a couple of Greek root words that mean pretending or acting out a part in a theatrical role. Jesus is being challenged in his authenticity as a practicing Jew, and Jesus is throwing back at them the same challenge. While he is being challenged in his inability to keep rabbinical law, he is challenging their authentic living out of God's law, the Ten Commandments. And that, you see, is really key here. These commandments have a rich part in that shared history. They were given to God's people in a moment of duress that it could lead them into to becoming an effective community and lead them eventually all the way to and beyond the Promised Land. They are commandments that are rooted in relationship, how it is that people need to treat each other and relationship with God. And while the opponents in this particular text are very concerned with hand hygiene as a means of exclusion, Jesus 
throws at them how it is that our behaviors can actually cause harm to others. No longer is it about one's personal piety's effect on their own selves, but it's about how our actions impact the community around us, the worshiping body of which we are a part of, and how it is that that communal identity breaks down when we are unable to follow this list of laws. Actions which include this long list Jesus gives, which as a part of it are four of the commandments themselves, theft, murder, adultery, and deceit. And these, these are not surface level issues. These are not things that can be solved by washing one's hands. These require something deeper. These are matters of the heart. These are matters that require the very thing that Jesus' ministry begins with, starting with John the Baptist himself, repentance a willingness to turn around, to change one's heart. And I think today, as I listen to this text, I can't help but think about authentic worship requires more than clean hands. Authentic worship requires a clean heart. Worship is an act of praise done in community where two or more are gathered. It is an act guided by rules and traditions. But when I read this text, what I really hear Jesus saying is that the only rule that really decides whether or not what you're doing is worth doing is if your heart is in it. That you are being authentic to yourself and your relationship with God and the people of God who stand alongside of you. So if if smells and bells of high church are what gives you an authentic experience of God's presence in your life, then do it. If silent meditation is what brings you close to God or, or 16,000 youth inside the Smoothie King Center brings you an authentic relationship with God and God's people, then do it. If sitting in a cathedral with stained glass windows and Gothic architecture brings you close to God, then do it. If sitting in the cathedral of God's creation is how you find closeness to God in your heart, then that is authentic worship. One of the big challenges I think the church has faced, not just in recent years, but clearly all the way back to the time of Jesus, is this accusation that the church and the people that make it up are not always authentic. You can Google it. There are so many articles about this that exist out there. The church is full of hypocrites, people who come together and pay lip service to God for one hour a week, but then curse and exclude others the, under, the other 167 hours. The church, the church is baffled because it sticks to its traditions from yesteryear and then can't figure out why it's being left behind in the current days and the future that is to come. These are the kinds of challenges that I hear when I listen to this exchange between Jesus, the scribes, and the Pharisees here today. And I think the key is really simple. The key is about being authentic, but understanding that authenticity means clinging to the tradition at the heart of Jesus' ministry, the tradition of love, service, and accompaniment experienced in community with others. It means being doers of the word. Generosity not only in giving our money, but giving our time and our compassion to others. As James says today, to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and even slower to anger. Instead of setting up rules to exclude people from being a part of our community, we need to follow a law that is all about sustaining community, assuring that we are caring for each other and not doing harm to one another through our actions, intentional or otherwise. I got to say, I think Dr. Stewart had it right. Every action in worship is liturgical, but now I better understand that every act of care and compassion is itself an act of worship. If liturgy is the work of the people, our work does not end when we are sent from this place. In fact, I believe that our work is just beginning, and that's why every week we end the same way. We end with a reminder that we are sent with God's peace and we are called to serve. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.
drawn together drawn together in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the church, God's good creation, and all who are in need, responding with the words, receive our prayer. On this Labor Day weekend, we remember and give thanks for all who have fought for workers' rights around the world. Continue to improve working conditions and establish fair wages so that all people may thrive. Merciful God, God of creation, you named humans as co-creators with you. Where the earth cries out in pain, bring wholeness. Guide governments and industry that environmental laws and practices seek to heal and not harm. Bring relief and justice to people and places suffering from climate catastrophe. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Healing God, you draw near to all who are hurting. Be with all who desire relief from chronic and acute illness, cancer, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Strengthen health care workers, therapists, and caregivers. Tend to those who are close to our hearts, especially those on our prayer list, and all those we name aloud or in our hearts. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Comforting God, console us as we mourn our departed. We hold fast to the promise that death has been defeated by our Savior Jesus Christ. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. At this time, I would invite you to get those little communion kits out that you may have received on your way in, and you can start opening them up. Uh, you're going to start by peeling the little plastic tab off, which will get you your host, and then the second tab, which opens it up for the grape juice. If your neighbor is struggling, feel free to assist one another in this process, but also at this time, we give thanks for all the gifts that we offer this day, our time in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving those things that we bring with us and leave behind and continued support of our mission and our ministry that is authentic, authentically uh, loving of our neighbor and the God who blesses us all. So again, thank you this day and always for that generosity. So now we sing out in response to that generosity with our invitation to the table. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it for his disciples to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We gather at this table of God's mercy and forgiveness. All are welcome. Young and old believers, questioners, and questioning believers, we gather to be fed because we are all beloved children of God. All are welcome. There is a place for everyone, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, color, culture, socioeconomic circumstance, for Christ is our host and we are all honored guests. All are welcome. At this time, I would welcome you to take and to eat, for this is the body of Christ which is broken for you. And once more, I would welcome you to take and to drink, for this is the blood of Christ which is shed for you. this body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, Assist those who set forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick or homebound. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those who will receive this sacrament and give us all the comfort of your abiding presence through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And receive now this blessing, the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. And at this time, we're going to get our workout in. I'd invite you to please stand as you are comfortable in doing so for our sending song this day.
God. And enjoy your ice cream over at the check-in table. <laughs>